Hey, welcome back, everybody. It's July the 20th, Monday Morning Briefing, episode number 40. Uh, today is actually Tuesday. I'm shooting this today. Yesterday, we got in the shop and had to get everything kind of packaged up. Last week, we ended up getting our refill, our restock of the Buckhorn briefcase patterns. What we did was we kind of set up a... I took the product off of the website, so if you are new to this channel or new to uh, this particular video on the channel and went to the website and could not find the actual briefcase pattern on the website, that's why I, I kind of hid it on the website. And that way our reserve list, because we had a list going of people that had kind of said, hey, hold me a copy, hold me a copy as soon as they get in, I want to get them because the first run sold out so quickly. So we just hid the product page for this for this pattern and then sent all the people on our list we sent them an email and told them hey go on, go online and go ahead and purchase your your copy and then that way it made it a little easier on us than having to go through each individual person and get shipping details and all that they could just do that themselves when they purchase the product once the uh, reserve list was done which is about saturday i think we've got still maybe three or four that still haven't gotten theirs no problem we've got plenty left so we went ahead and put it, put it back up on the website. So it is now available on the website again. I think there's 45 copies left or so, and we are getting the printers to do another run so that we have plenty when we go to Waco. And so the Buckhorn briefcase, if you've been waiting on it, the pattern is on the website, and we will update the description of that video as well. Uh, but there is a link that goes straight to the website to this product page if you want the pattern pack for that. And just remember, too, that this is not offered in a digital download. So the printed version is the only way that we're offering this because it's so large. So um, we're going to keep it that way for quite some time. So if you want one, you can pick one up in Waco. You can go to our website and order one. We are shipping domestically, but we're not shipping internationally at this time. So um, I'm sorry about that, but we'll work on trying to get that like we've said in other videos. We also added to the printed pack page the checkbook cover. Now this is another one just like the clutch wallet. It's the exact same pattern as the digital download. So there's no difference. So if you already have the digital pattern for either one of these, the, the checkbook cover or the new clutch wallet, you don't need a printed version unless you would just like a printed copy with this fancy little envelope. But other than that, what's in here is it just like what the files that you get and print out. Um, but we're slowly just kind of adding some of the older ones to the printed versions just because we do have some folks that would prefer us just mail them something instead of printing them out um, themselves. And so the next one we added was the checkbook cover. And I think it turned out really nice. But anyway, it's on the website as well. If, you, if you'd like to have that one, you can certainly get that. All of these we will be bringing to Waco if you are going to the Heart of Texas Leather Show in Waco, Texas, August the 6th, 7th, and 8th. Um, we will be there. We will have a lot of these patterns there. Like I said, I don't know what all stuff we're going to have in the booth. We're mainly just getting a booth just so we have kind of a place to hang out and, and uh, meet some folks. And like I said, we'll have some stuff there. I'm cutting some extra parts, so we'll have some fun parts uh, as far as like leather kits and stuff that um, I don't know how many of each one will have, but I'm just going to bring an array of stuff. And if somebody's interested in picking up some pre-cut stuff, we'll have some stuff there like that. Um, real quick, the Lost Trade podcast, like we said last week, Chuck Storm's episode was the last one that we had a dark week or two in there. And then this week, it actually posted yesterday, was uh, our interview with uh, Zephan Parker from Parker Boot Company out of Houston, Texas. A really neat interview. He works right in the middle of Houston, Texas, right in downtown, um, somewhere one of the little districts there in downtown. And he's got a really neat story. He's got a neat boot shop. He's got a number of guys that work with him that he's trained. And so he's not a one-man show like many of us are, but it's a really interesting kind of look at the way he does stuff. I think he said in that interview that he does, uh, like tries to aim for two pair of boots a week, which sounds like, oh my God, he's starting and finishing two pair of boots a week. Well, like we talk about in the interview, if you're doing something like that, especially on saddles, you're not actually physically building that one that week. You're finishing two pair a week. So those two pair that you finish may have been, been worked on for two or three weeks, maybe four weeks, you know, as you go along. So it's really neat just kind of the systems he kind of took from what he's learned in his career and stuff and, and, and watching kind of the, the bigger shops and the way they kind of manage their workflow and stuff to where he can now get to that point to where he's actually finishing and shipping two pair a week um, or having two pair picked up a week. And that, that's kind of a neat way to look at it. You can take some of those aspects from the manufacturing world and you can actually incorporate them into a custom shop within reason and you can actually increase your efficiencies and stuff. It's just kind of like building wallets. It's, it's just as easy to build for the most part. It's 
just as easy to build, you know, say six wallets as it is to build one because you're doing, you know, you're setting all this up, interiors up on six, you're sewing them all together, you're getting your tooling six panels, you're putting six panels on the interiors, and then you're, you know, finishing six of them. And so anytime you can do that to increase your efficiency, it's a lot easier than changing gears every five seconds, starting one job and finishing it. We have talked about in the past that it's always better to at least finish one thing. So to start, don't, don't start 47 different things, but start maybe one or two things and take them to the completion before you start the next thing. I'm bad about that here in the shop as well, just because we've got so much going on that I'm, I'll start, you know, two saddles, four or five belts, some repair, we start all these projects just because I feel like if I move them forward a little bit, that's better than them just sitting there waiting on me. And unfortunately, like the repairs, we do have them just sitting there waiting on me right now because I don't have time to get to them at the moment. And um, it, it's just kind of a constant battle. So just know that, you know, if you have those struggles, if you have that, that you're dealing with as far as like, how do I manage this workflow? I'm feeling overwhelmed. I've got too many orders going. I've got too many irons in the fire. You have to kind of give yourself a little bit of grace and just kind of manage it and, and begin to see those moments that you can actually incorporate things that may help your process just a little bit. Because I'm in, I'm in it 16 years now or so, and I still battle that from day to day, you know, just trying to, to stay efficient and stay productive and not just have 4,000 things laid out on my bench like I do at the moment. It is kind of a challenge and something that you gotta kind of kind of work with. But but Zeef and Parker's interview was really good, so check that out. If you haven't uh, listened to Lost Trade Podcast, you can find that on Apple or Spotify. And this month, if you got your Leather Crafters Journal, and if you're not subscribed to the Leather Crafters Journal, um, I highly recommend it. It's a really neat uh, publication. It comes out. It's got lots of tips in there. These are also the same folks that are putting on the Leather Show in Waco. And uh, there's another one also called Shop Talk. That's another good one that you can get, um, find their website and, and get subscribed to that magazine as well. It's very good just because it, it has a lot of ad advertisements in here for suppliers you may not know about, machinery people. It's got a lot of cool articles by a bunch of different craftsmen out there and uh, in the industry. And it's just, it's just a really good magazine to uh, get in your shop and give you some inspiration and kind of look at stuff and see what's going on in the industry. But one of the reasons I bring it up is because they actually did a little blurb for us for Lost Trade Podcast in their issue this month. And I was really excited to see that. Um, she kind of mentioned that she was going to do that. And I kind of honestly forgot about it until I got the magazine in and we were kind of thumbing through it over lunch and ended up running across it. But but we got a little little spot in there about the podcast. So we wanted to thank them and, and let them know that we really do appreciate that. And any any little promotion or advertisement that we can get for Lost Trade is a good deal just because it's kind of a, a passion project, really. That's all, you know, we're just kind of putting that together and doing it just for fun and uh, getting a chance to interview some really great craftsmen and, and kind of see where this thing goes. So that was really cool. But get subscribed to the Leather Crafters Journal if you're not already. And if you're going to Waco and you're not subscribed to it, you can certainly visit with them about that at the show. They'll be there, and I'm, cer I'm certain you can go ahead and sign up for a subscription there. I don't think it costs a bunch, and there's not a lot of uh, leather trade magazines out there, so anything you can do to stay connected with the industry is going to be really good, especially if you're just starting out and just learning. Um, I also want to give a thank you to a, a friend of mine named Woody, and uh, he is a trapper out of Georgia, and he does some leather work and stuff. He's a really neat guy. He's bought some patterns from us, and we've helped him out with some things here and there and kind of just becoming friends. We, in a conversation that him and I had a while back, we just got talking about trapping and stuff. And I've, and I've got a few raccoon hides that I haven't tanned yet that I've wanted, my intention was to get them tanned and make my kids some coonskin caps just to, just because they're, they're fun and they're, they're just kind of neat. And I uh, wanted to do that before they got too old and, and wouldn't wear them, obviously. <laughs> so we're going to do that. But I had mentioned that to him, and he's got some videos on tanning your own hides and, and working with uh, fur and stuff. And so I've been watching his channel and, and doing that deal. And, and then from that conversation, we ended up getting a box in last week. And inside that box were two coonskin caps that he made for the kids. I think he ended up making 10 or 12 of these things for, I'm sure, his grandkids and, and just other things. You know, he... he trying to put fur to use and stuff, but he made and sent these to us and I just want to really thank him and, and uh, give him a little shout out here on the channel. And so you can certainly check out his channel and, and uh, if you're into trapping or just want to see what goes into making fur hides for making the garments and different things like that, then uh, be sure and check out his stuff. But yeah, we were really, really excited. The kids were excited. 
Um, they're not wearing them now because it's 100 degrees outside right now, but I know this winter time they'll probably run around run around town wearing these things occasionally, but they're just really neat and I'm, I'm really glad to have them. We we're real appreciative of that. And so we're gonna hang them up in the shop for now, just on display. And then when the kids wanna wear them, they can pull them down, throw them on and just pie eye and get out and, and run around with a coonskin cap on, which I think is pretty cool. Just something fun for them to do. and They are really excited. So thank you again, Woody. Check out his channel if you get a chance on YouTube. Um, also, a lot of people have been asking, how's the belts going for the kids? So, um, because now I've, I think I'm three belts behind with the buckles that they've won at these, uh, these little cow shows. And so I got my little boys, one of his done, um, all tooled up and, and kind of painted. I've got to do a little touch up paint on there, but we got it ready to go. We got to do some edge dyeing and then my wife's going to end, um, buck stitch it with red buck stitch, kangaroo buck stitch. So that's what she wanted to do on this one. And he's got plans on the next one that I got to do for him. And then I still, owe my daughter won. So we're going to get started on those and hopefully get, get those done. Um, this week or maybe by this weekend so they'll have new belts for the jamboree so the jamboree is up this weekend comes up this weekend it's saturday and sunday and so we'll be out there all day saturday and then sunday is the parade sunday morning and my wife actually got volunteered for being a parade judge i believe judging the parade floats and stuff so we're excited it's going to be an exciting weekend she's got a horse sale this week and so she's going to be helping with that on thursday and friday and then she'll be back friday afternoon and then we'll be ready to go for the uh for the jamboree this weekend and 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 go through that and and see how all that goes so if you're in the area come by and uh check out the molten jamboree last week was pretty fun friday was a total visitor day we had a bunch of visitors in i had a friend of mine from uh, floresville that came up that we hadn't seen in quite some time he took a class with me oh i guess it's been two three four years ago three or four years ago he took a class with us um, he's taking some bit making classes. He's just a really neat guy and uh, they were off on Friday not doing much And so he wanted to come up and see the shop So he came in and hung out with us for quite a while and uh, really enjoyed the visit with him And then we also had some other folks come in that were from Tennessee and they were making the rounds They went to Waco and Springfield and they were just making a big old loop Just kind of driving around and seeing folks and they said we were on their way from uh, Makers to Springfield so I don't know how from Waco to Missouri, but they, they came down this way and they came in for a visit and we got to visit with them. Super, super nice folks. Does some really good work. He's got a cool shop and uh, we really, really enjoyed visiting with him. And then I had my buddy Kenneth come down from Dallas and he brought me some pecan wood from a barbecue pit. And so that was pretty neat. He had a bunch extra that he was kind of looking for a home for and asked if I ever cooked with that. And obviously I do. I, I like all kinds of woods uh, to smoke with. So he ended up bringing me two big bins of pecan wood. So we got that swapped out. And he also gave me some soap. He said that <laughs> they were they were on vacation and they were staying in a cabin and uh, had some flies and stuff. And he had heard something or his wife did on Facebook or something, one of them home remedy deals that if you hang some Irish spring, uh, in particular Irish spring soap, that you won't have any flies. And he's been watching the Monday morning briefing and, and you've probably noticed as well, that we've had a little bit of a fly problem here <laughs> because all the rain and everything. So anyway, he, they had these in their cabin and then as a joke, he kind of, you know, hey, try this in your shop. And I thought, man, I'll try anything at this point. So I just took them and I set them on the bench back here and got back to work after they had left. And um, I haven't noticed very many flies in the shop at all. Now I may have killed them all because I went on a little bit of a uh, sniper type rampage in here and just spent about an hour killing flies one day because they were driving me insane. So that may have been effective, but I think these may, may actually work. So if you know anything about the Irish spring deal of hanging, hanging one of these up or something like that in, in a shop or in your house just to keep the uh, flies away, uh, comment below. Cause I, like I said, I'd never heard of that before, but Claudia said she had heard of it too. And, uh, but I, I really think it works. I mean, it's something about the smell. I know this soap is very strong and I particularly don't enjoy the odor of Irish spring personally. That's just me. Uh, but maybe that's the flies as well. They just don't like the smell and they're just like now nah, we're gonna We're gonna bounce and get out of here and, and uh, so whatever it takes to get the flies out of the shop I'm excited about so and so yeah Friday was just really busy with the people went visiting so that was a lot of fun um, We just kind of hung out and got to visit with a lot of folks and and uh, it was pretty much an all-day deal We had people in and out. I had some local people too in here picking some stuff up We got some stuff done a uh, little gift for an anniversary present for uh, our propane man here in town and uh, for his wife And he came by and picked that up and then we did a belt for um, 
a friend of, of our kids that her, his mom and dad wanted him to have a nice custom belt. So we made him a little kid belt and uh, they came out, came by and picked that up. So Friday was just real busy. Uh, Saturday we got in here, I got a lot of stuff cut and um, got a lot of stuff kind of made up. And we added a new color to the website on the Bifold wallets and it's a tobacco color. And it's the same goat skin that we've been using, but it's a tobacco color. And I believe they're all sold out. And those things, uh, we had one person that bought like eight of them, eight or nine of them. Um, so thank you very much for that. But we've got to order a bunch more goat skin because I didn't realize, I thought I had a whole pile of it back there still that I hadn't cut yet. But Saturday when I got to cut and I couldn't find it. So evidently I'd already cut it. So we're if we're out of the Bifo wallets uh, right now, which I believe we are on the website, just hang tight because I'm going to order some today. And then we'll get some more interiors cut and we'll get those put on as well. Um, those seem to be doing really good. And I don't blame you all for buying those things because I, if I had to hand cut all those little pockets out to make one of our bifolds or any bifold really, um, which we did for quite a while, I made a bunch of them where I hand cut them out, but it takes so much time for the interiors. Outside of cutting your interior pieces, um, a bifold wallet goes together very quickly. And so you can really spend more time in the tooling part of that and, and make your money on the tooling than on the construction. Because if, you, if you're hand cutting those little tea pockets and all the pieces and all that stuff, and then spending two hours tooling on a wallet back, you've got to get quite a bit for it for you to be able to come out. But if you're either clicking them out uh, on your own clicker and clicking out all your pieces, you can put the interiors together in 30 minutes. If you're, if, you're, if you're buying them for me, same thing. You can get them and the interiors are cut. You just put them together and then all you've got to do is your artwork on your back. And, um, and that works out really well. I think on those wallets, a uh, few people have asked what do I kind of get on them. I try to stay around 150 on one of those bifolds, depending on the artwork. If you were to do a really intricate floral pattern with a lot of color or dye work and then buck stitch it or something like that, I would be around that 200, two and a quarter range probably. Um, so just kind of use that as a rule of thumb. Um, again, we always get into pricing. We always get into that kind of stuff. I've, I've got a lot of stuff on my mind about pricing and kind of what to do. There's a few books out there that guys have done specifically for the leather industry on pricing. We've done some articles on our website on pricing, so you can definitely go back on our website and look at that and kind of get an idea of kind of the mathematics behind how I look at it. And then the interesting thing was talking to Chuck Storms and he uses the $100 an hour deal, um, which is just you, what, how many ever hours it takes you to make something, you do $100 an hour plus material. So whatever your material cost. Um, I, I think that's, I've always thought that was just kind of too easy. Like I didn't want to use that because it just, that's just pulling a number out and that's what all so many people use. So I stick with my more complicated way of pricing things and I have a spreadsheet set up and that article on our website talks about it. Um, but I have a spreadsheet and I just put in the material cost and then how many hours I've spent and all that kind of stuff. And then it takes care of like a, uh, we have a sales charge in there um, and that's time on the phone, time texting. And then we've also got um, your overhead fee in there, um, you know, adding overhead costs, which is gonna be things you can't count like glue, thread, your AC, your insurance, you know, um, all of those things that, that you're not really thinking about but are part of what's called overhead. And, um, and then it also puts a profit on there and adds that profit on top. And that's the piece that most people are missing. And so if you've heard our interview with Lisa Sorrell, she brought that up and was real adamant about that, that most people don't, leave, don't count the profit. They don't put a profit on top of that. Your labor is not your wage. That's not your profit. And so if you spend two hours doing something, whether you do it or whether you paid somebody to do it, that's a labor charge. So if you were a silent owner and you paid somebody for the two hours it takes to make that thing, and then you take their two hours plus the material and sold it at that price, you didn't make anything. You paid their wage, but you didn't make anything. So you have to put the profit on top. Here's the interesting thing. Like I said, Chuck Storms talks about that on using the $100 an hour deal, and I've always heard that, that a lot of them guys do that. And uh, like he said in the interview, uh, business guy that he knew said, if you're good at what you do and you're professional, it's worth a hundred bucks an hour. Everybody knows that. Well, I, I didn't know that. And he said he didn't know that either, that evidently everybody's worth a hundred bucks an hour, but it sounds like a lot. Um, you know, a lawyer charges three or $400 an hour, doctors, who knows what they make an hour, but a hundred just sounds like a lot, right? But if you call a plumber or you call a mechanic, to, you know, come, come to your house and work on something, or if you call an electrician to your house to diagnose a problem, 
they're going to charge you 100 bucks an hour. That's just the way it works, um, at least. And so with him saying that and everything else, when I got done with the interview, I actually came in here and I priced out, say, a saddle or a belt. I don't remember what it was, but I priced something out in my spreadsheet. And then when it gave me the sales price, I divided that again by my hours, how many hours I worked on that item. And when I did that, that sales price actually worked out to be 100 bucks an hour. Um, and that was after materials was taken out. So then I did another item and it came out to around a hundred bucks an hour. And I did another item and it came out to about a hundred bucks an hour. So I'm not completely convinced that everybody should just use a hundred bucks an hour and then plus material and then you should be pricing right. But I will say that I will guarantee you that you'll be closer to what you actually should be charging um, based on the, not only the market, but also just profitability. Because if you, if you look at something that takes you two hours and if you're charging, you know, a hundred bucks for it, well, that's 50 an hour, but that, then you got materials in there and then your overhead and everybody has overhead, whether you're working out of a spare bedroom or, you know, an, an old dilapidated chicken shed, it doesn't matter. You have overhead. And so you've got to count all that stuff. And I don't care what other people charge. I just charge what I charge and I do what I do. I don't compare prices. I'll look at the market just to see, but at the end of the day, it's, I have a monopoly on what I build and you have a monopoly on what you build. Nobody can get one of your belts from anybody else but you. So if somebody wants a belt from you, they have to come to you. You have a predetermined monopoly. Nobody can change that. If they want one of your belts and they come to me, they're going to get one of my belts. And if they go to somebody else, they're going to get one of their belts. So the, 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 the cool thing is that you do have a monopoly. So when it comes down to it, you can charge what you want to charge. You can charge whatever whatever best suits your lifestyle, whatever best suits your shop and where you're at. But the pricing is the difference between success and failure in a business. And if you're not making it or you're struggling or cash flows tight and this and that, a lot of times it's because you're not charging enough. It's not because you don't have enough work, especially in the leather deal. Most people that do leather work will be quickly asked to make something for somebody um, because leather is just one of those things that people see it. They've they look at it, oh, you made that belt or that knife sheath or whatever. They're going to want to order one. Um, and so you'll quickly get some orders. The trick is being able to price them correctly so that you're not just, you know, doing it for no for no reason or losing money. Um, I would rather not make any money than lose money. And so even if you're doing it as a hobby, at least make sure that you're, you're making a little bit so that you can continue to grow your hobby. If you're just breaking even and just covering your material costs, you're not making any extra to be able to maybe purchase new tools or upgrade to a sewing machine or maybe, you know, buy some extra material and make some uh, already made pre-stock items for Christmas or maybe start that Etsy store you've been wanting to do or whatever it might be. Profit is the only way you can do that. If you're pulling that money out of what the material money is that came in or out of your labor cost, it's not it's not going to last. It's not going to work. You're always going to be struggling. So you have to be sure the profit's on there. And like I said, I, I just found it in, interesting that, that even my spreadsheet came out to about 100 bucks an hour um, on most items. Some of them varied, some were higher, some were lower. And, but it's just, it's just kind of cool to see that that's, that's actually there. He's actually probably years ago already done the math and figured out his shop rate, his overhead fees, his sales fee, the extra time he's going to spend texting and talking on the phone with the customer, all those different things. Over the years, he's figured out and he's come up with that rate, which makes it very easy for him to price stuff. Um, and, and mine's not super difficult. It's just the math that's behind that spreadsheet is a little more cumbersome than just simply saying 100 bucks an hour. And um, I'm not going to say I'll never go to that just for quick deal, but I have used it in the last couple of weeks since that interview where um, a customer's come in and asked about something oddball that I don't normally build. And I can just see it in my mind that it's probably going to take me two, two and a half hours so I'll just tell them it's probably going to be two to three hundred bucks. And that allows me to be honest with them, honest with myself. And uh, because it's real easy when you're standing there with a customer to just quickly say, I don't know, I'll do it for a hundred bucks. Then you get into it and you're there half a day trying to make this item or trying to make the second one because the first one didn't work or whatever it is. Um, and like I said, there's nothing wrong with that. If you're, if you're just starting out and you're doing it as a hobby, you know, keep doing that. But keep the pricing thing just in your mind because you want to you're going to want to grow at some point, whether you're going to, going to want to grow your hobby, take your hobby to a business, 
grow your business, whatever you're going to do, you're going to need extra funds there for growth. And you don't want to have to feed this thing all the time. Um, in most marriages, one of the partners is going to want at least the, the hobby to pay for itself. <laughs> so it's not taken out of the household funds. So that's another reason to kind of just look at it. You know, if it's just something you make things and you give them away or whatever, uh, throw you a few jobs in there too that would pay um, and, and just kind of play with that pricing structure just to see because your time is valuable. Um, no matter your skill level, no matter where you're sitting, the, the time that you put into an item does have a value and people will pay for that. Um, and you just want to price it honestly with yourself and then let the customer decide if the value is there enough for them to give you their cash um, in, in, in exchange for what you made. But that's kind of our pricing deal. Like I said, I didn't want to get on too big of a deal, but I've, I've got it on my mind and I'm kind of thinking that I'm, I might try to do something. I don't know what, uh, I don't, I, I'm not prepared to write a book as far as like an actual book, but um, doing something on just the business side of this, because I know from the podcast and then as well as the emails that we get based on our YouTube videos and then, you know, off our blog and stuff, people are very interested in the business side of this. Everybody's got a side hustle these days. So everybody's real interested in how do we, you know, how do I make this thing work? How to make it more profitable? Cause I want to buy a sewing machine or a clicker or whatever. So it's got to work. And, um, I, I don't feel like I have all the answers because I struggled for many, many years. And, uh, the first, I'd say the first 10 years of my career was a, a struggle and, uh, pretty tough. But I have gotten to a point to where I feel like I understand it better. We still struggle. We still have problems. We still have, you know, issues we've got to figure out and things we've got to do to become more efficient and, and manage money better and stuff like that. So it, it is a struggle. But I do feel like I, I, I can probably help some. And I, and I like talking about pricing and I like talking about the business side of this deal, not only just the leather application, which I really enjoy. So we may try to do something more and more, maybe do some uh, business tip videos or, or, or something, or maybe write some more articles for the blog. Um, I'm just kind of wheeling around the ideas in my mind right now because this topic comes up so much. So um, I appreciate it. I hope, hope you found that interesting. Like I said, I don't, I don't know how many of y'all care about pricing, but I know of, based on the emails, a lot of you do. So, um, but nobody gets started with leather work and says, hey, let's uh, get a calculator out and figure out the math behind this. No, we want to get the leather and we want to get the tools and start whooping on leather and doing our doing our thing and learning the skill set. That's how we start. That's how we want to go. Um, but at some point, we've got to look at the business side of things, too, just to make sure all those ducks are in a row and not running amongst in the field out there crazy and, and we're losing money. But that's that. A quick update. We are working on the tooling course. We mentioned a few Monday mornings back. Um, we've just been so busy trying to get... Waco and uh, going and, and just different things through the summer. It's just kind of been nuts. Um, I think my summer is going to be this way for the rest of my life, actually, because it's not it's not all just the shop. Like it's the kids being out of school and little programs and we're doing this and doing that, trying to keep them busy, um, trying to not bore them to death in the shop every day because uh, they end up trying to tear it down. And so we try to keep them active and, and doing things and showing and stuff. And so um, I just think that's what I've got ahead of me now, that they're getting older, that the summers are just going to kind of be a wash. And I'm just going to have to do my best to keep the shop together as we go through the summer. And then when they're back in school, we get a little reprieve because they're at school during the day and we can kind of get re recoup because, man, it's, it's been tough as far as like Claudia coming in here in the mornings trying to get her ships done and then, you know, and then they can go do whatever they're going to do or, or do do whatever's going on. And so it's just kind of challenging. You parents out there, y'all have no pity for me. You know exactly where I'm sitting, especially if your kids are grown and gone or, or if your kids are, you know, self-sufficient and teenagers, you know, that they, they can kind of kind of handle themselves. So you don't have to worry about stuff quite as much. But it's all fun. It's all good. We'll get it all figured out. But I have noticed that that um, this is the way the summers are going to be for for a little while. But as far as, like I said, the tooling course, we are working on that. I've shot a, a little bit of the footage. I'm trying to get it because I want this course to be very in-depth. Uh, this this is going to be the course that takes you from the drawing course into actually now app, uh, putting the application of that drawing into an actual floral pattern in the leather. And I'm, we're talking about the tools. We're talking about swivel knives. We're talking about uh, all the different stamping tools, the leather, the casing. There's a whole deal. I've got an entire uh, outline for this deal. It's going to be pretty pretty in depth. It's probably going to be long, and and I think that's going to be good because that's what the academy is designed for. YouTube, um, a two hour video is something I try not to do, like the Buckhorn briefcase video. That's probably the longest video I'll ever put on YouTube if I can help it because 
it's just that's a lot like that that in itself could be a course on the academy just because we could have gone even more in depth on some some areas of that bag but but the academy allows me to do a longer format to where you you know you can take it in in sections and and go through all those videos and go through all those resources and learn a skill set or learn a process or whatever and that that I can't I can't do it that way on YouTube just because you know, nobody's gonna watch a 10 hour video on YouTube so um, that's what we're kind of working on but I'm starting to put it together I was hoping to have it done I thought man I'll start this course and we'll just start filming and I'll shoot a little bit every day and we'll launch this course at Waco and we'll have it done and people can sign up right there and do all that that was my intention when we first mentioned it that's what that was my plan and the more I get into it um, there's just too much to talk about for me to throw that course together in the three months since I mentioned it, two months since I mentioned it. We're just going to take our time. Hopefully we'll have it out maybe by the end of the year, but we're, we are working on it and I've got quite a bit of footage already shot and uh, different things. I'm just trying to do pieces of it here and there, but it's going to take you through and show you all of the aspects of, of actual floral carving and get you to a point to where you'll know when your leather's cased enough, not cased, not cased enough when your swivel knife is sharp or dull or why you would want one swivel knife over another one what's the difference between an angle blade and a straight blade a thin blade and a thick blade a beater blade there's all kinds of different tools in there and so i want to talk about all those and then all the stamps we can spend days talking about stamps but we're going to talk about my tool roll basically which is the the, the set of stamps that i use for 99 percent of the floral tooling that we do and so we'll be talking about all that and then we'll take through a bunch of different patterns and different applications how to make a flower look like it's facing away from you versus facing towards you how do we do the the turn backs so where a leaf or a petal flips over on itself you know how are we doing the scrolls what what, what are the different ways of tooling you know all these different types of scrolls um, and it's not going to all all be just the way i do everything in my style but also some other styles that you can you can take from there and incorporate and do some different things so one of the things, so that's coming. We're going to be working on that, and we'll keep you posted. We'll keep you updated on uh, when that's ready. We will probably, when that course is done, and it's not going to be done anytime soon, so don't trip out, but probably, hopefully by towards the fall, end of the year, somewhere around there, it'll be completed. When it is, we will launch it to the newsletter first. So if you want first, you know, contact, you want, you know, notification when it's ready, the minute it's ready, then be sure you're on our newsletter list. Um, but like this is one of the patterns that I'm working on here uh, for that rope bag. Something like this I would call just more of like a traditional Sheridan. It's got well, what I call my council inspired flower. I call it a council flower in the shop, but it's inspired off of the flower that Howard Council used on many, many of his saddles when he was building. And um, I, I did not copy it just directly, but it has a look to it that I call, you know, it's council inspired because he was kind of one of my heroes and, and looking up to kind of the work that he did and stuff like that. And I just think that flower kind of looks, it's not really that unique, but it's just something that tells me whenever I go to sit down a tool um, and I can tell somebody, hey, this is my council flower. Do you like that? And if they like it, that's what I do. And this is the type of the vine work that I normally do on that. Um, a lot of people, and we'll talk about time frame too, as far as tooling in that course on, uh, on taking time and like how, how much time should something take you. I don't worry about time. It, it, you know, I, I can tool a belt in an hour and a half, maybe sometimes two hours, depending on the belt. Um, it may take you six hours. It doesn't matter. Time, speed comes with experience so the longer you tool the faster you'll get don't worry about speed um, i know you're charging by the hour we just talked about the hundred dollar an hour deal but you'll have to kind of compensate for that and kind of understand where you are um, in your skill set but work on the efficiencies of the tools and the cadence of those tools and when you use them and that's the biggest part of what we'll talk about in that tooling deal because it'll really help speed you up you don't want to rush through a tooling pattern but you can do a lot of things to cut out excessive waste of time um, hunting for tools, you know, picking up different tools every five seconds to finish out one little section. There's a lot of things we can talk about in there. But this this rope bag here, I think I spent probably seven hours tooling this one piece here. I tried to time it and then people called and then I was out with customers and so I kind of, my little timer on my phone didn't work because I ended up spending an hour with somebody on the sales floor so that kind of threw me all off best i can figure it's about six seven hours to get this tool that's not drawing it i spent another probably two hours drawing this thing 
if not uh, three, but, but that's time that you've got to count as well. You've got to count that time in your estimate on stuff. So that's what we're talking about. There's a lot of different things um, that go into pricing leather work and, uh, and going on from there, um, especially when you start doing the floral stuff. And then I've got the back panel drawn on this as well. And, um, and we got his brand in there. And then we just did these little corner sets here just to accent the back. He didn't want the back quite as, quite as heavily tooled and that way his brand sticks out. So we'll get that, that done. I'm hoping to have this one done this week. So we've got some new chap leather that came in for the gussets and we'll get that going. The other rope can I have, I'm about halfway tooling that. I spent about three or four hours yesterday tooling on it. Um, again, I can't show you that because it is a surprise and a gift for a customer. And so we won't show that on YouTube until it has been given to the person that's receiving it. Guys, that's really all I got for you this week. I'm gonna go ahead and hop off here and get back to work. I need to clean the shop because it's an absolute wreck. So I'm gonna go ahead and try to sweep up and muck out and uh, organize some stuff right quick because I've got to cut some saddle parts and some other things. Be sure to sign up for the Leathercraft newsletter at dgsaddlery.com and that way you'll get notified of some new stuff. We do have something cool going on in the newsletter so you might want to be a part of that. Uh, kind of a little uh, newsletter only access page on there. So you might want to check that out. Appreciate y'all. We'll see you next week in the Monday morning briefing.